So today we're going to be going over the 12 lead EKG and what leads correspond to what anatomical areas of the heart. Now, some of you may have tried to memorize a chart like this, and I don't recommend that you do that because inevitably you're just going to come back and have to memorize it all over again later. So stay tuned, and today we're going to build a three-dimensional model of what these leads actually represent anatomically within the heart. All right, for some of you, this is going to be a review, but we got to go back to the basics. So remember, a three-lead monitor utilizes three electrodes. When you take two electrodes at a time, you can generate a monitoring lead. The positive electrode, in this case, being the left arm, and so we're looking down it, and any electrical activity going in the direction of this lead is going to generate a positive deflection on the monitor. Any electrical activity going away from it is going to generate a negative deflection. In this particular case, what we're looking at is lead one, and we have two other leads that operate similarly to this, which is lead two and lead three, and these are collectively known as the bipolar limb leads. Bipolar because they use two poles or two electrodes. Now the machine can do something uh, additional to this. We can create more monitoring leads by doing a special trick. And so the monitor in this case is only using one electrode as the positive, in this case, a left arm. But the negative is utilizing the theoretical midpoint between two of the other electrodes. And so these are known as unipolar leads, and three of them exist here, as shown. Unipolar because they're only using one electrode to create that lead. And they're known as augmented voltage leads because the voltage generated is actually pretty small, and the machine has to amplify that or augment it. These are known individually as augmented voltage right, augmented voltage left, and augmented voltage foot. And now we have drawn what is known as Eindhoven's triangle. And if you can reproduce this triangle, and, and I think it's pretty easy to do, then you understand the directions of the limb leads. Now take into account that the mean cardiac vector, which is the overall movement of electrical activity through the heart, runs basically from the right shoulder down to the left hip. And the reason that we use lead two, as you can see here, as our main monitoring lead is because this most closely approximates that mean cardiac vector. So before we go on any further, we do have to talk about something. Each of these leads is looking at cardiac vectors. The depolarization wave will generate a vector. Now, don't be freaked out by that if you don't remember your vector math. Let's take a simple analogy. So if you take a look at a piece of paper straight on, Okay, that paper is going to look like a normal sheet of paper. But as you start rotating it around, what will happen is that piece of paper will actually get smaller and even smaller still as you keep rotating it until eventually you're basically going to see nothing but a, a sliver, a line. It's essentially going to disappear right in front of you. Now, if you keep rotating that paper, now you're going to see the back side of the paper. Okay, this is something to keep in mind as you're looking at these leads. So the way this works is that in essence, when you have a monitoring lead, that lead can only see things that are running in the direction of the lead itself. And so in this case, uh, represented by the green line, we have a, a depolarization vector that's not quite going in the same direction as lead one. So what lead one is going to see is only that component, and now here's where the vector math comes in, only that vector component that is aligned perfectly with the monitoring lead. And so in this case, lead one would be a good lead to see the activity going in this direction. But if we had a different vector going in this direction, lead one would not be such a good lead because as you can see, only this portion is going to be captured by that lead. We'd have to switch to a different lead to see this vector a little more clearly. It would generate a smaller amplitude wave than the previous one. The other thing to keep in mind is just as we rotated that paper completely around and saw the reverse side of it, if we have a vector going in this direction opposite the lead, remember what we're going to see is, is a nice deflection because it is running almost parallel to this lead. However, that deflection is not going to be positive. It's moving against the direction of the lead and so it will actually generate a negative deflection in this case. So now let's go back to Eindhoven's triangle and see the magic happen. As you can see here, when I am looking at the left side of the heart, which is the lateral aspect of it, I'm going to be looking at leads 1 and AVL because as you can see here, the arrowheads point directly there. If I'm looking at the inferior wall of the heart, which is down here, I'm going to be looking at these three leads, which are 2, 3, and AVF, and these will give me an idea of what's going on in the inferior wall. 
Something else to take a look at also is notice that AVR is almost, not quite, but almost a direct opposite of lead two. And this will help with lead placement. When you first put on your 12 leads and you run your strip, take a look at AVR, and that should be an upside down lead in reference to lead two. If it's not, check your lead placement. So all the leads we've looked at so far have given us a two-dimensional view of the heart because we've been working in the coronal plane. But the heart is three-dimensional. It extends inferiorly and anteriorly in the chest. And so we need to look at it from a different angle as well. So now we're going to be working in the transverse plane. Now if you use our imagination, here is our patient. Here is their front side facing down. And here is their back side facing up on the screen. And their feet would be directly in front of you. Here's our left and right ventricles, and we can now place electrodes on the chest so that we can generate more views. The machine is then going to take these electrodes and calculate the theoretical center. So these are going to be unipolar leads like we talked about with the augmented voltage leads. And from that theoretical center, these unipolar leads will now face out toward the electrode. And these are leads V1 through V6. We call these the precordial leads. Now, remember the heart is rotated, and this drawing isn't you know, completely anatomically correct. But V1 and V2 are really looking at the septum. V3 and V4 are looking at the anterior wall of the left ventricle. And V5 and V6 are showing you the lateral wall of the left ventricle. So now we can take everything that we've learned and put it all together. Remember, in the transverse plane, we have our precordial leads, V1 through V6. And in the coronal plane, we have our limb leads, the bipolar limb leads, 1, 2, and 3, and the unipolar limb leads, AVR, AVL, and AVF. This is how they'll be arranged on the 12 lead tracing. And as we've discussed before, V1 and V2 are looking at the interventricular septum. V3 and V4 are looking at the anterior left ventricular wall. And V5 and V6 are looking at the lateral left ventricular wall. Leads 1 and AVL are also showing us the lateral left ventricular wall in the limb leads. And leads 2, 3, and AVF will show us the inferior wall. Now recall that a STEMI is greater than 1 millimeter of ST elevation in two or more contiguous leads. Contiguous leads are those that are right next to each other, as the precordial leads are, or leads that look at the same area of the heart. For example, leads 1 and AVL are contiguous with leads V6 and V5 because they look at the lateral aspect of the left ventricle. Now, what you may have already picked up on is that we have a very large blind spot going on here. We're not looking at the posterior aspect of the heart at all. And this comes into play if you ever have ST segment depressions in the septal and anterior leads. And if you don't have the ST elevation, what you may be looking at is ST elevation from the opposite direction. And that means that you may actually be dealing with a posterior wall infarct. And in order to find that, you're going to have to do a posterior EKG. And what we do is we take any of these precordial leads and we move them posteriorly uh, along the same uh, dermatomal line. V7, V8, and V9 are the leads that result, and these will give you a look at the posterior left ventricular wall, and you may actually find a posterior STEMI by doing that. Now, something else to keep in mind when we talk about leads 2, 3, and AVF looking at the inferior wall. This is just a uh, very simple diagram of the coronary arteries. Remember, they're called coronary for a reason, because they look like a crown. They, they come down from the top of the heart. There is no such thing as an inferior coronary artery. So when we look at the inferior leads, you have to ask yourself, which of these arteries is actually infarcting? And just a quick review, this is the left coronary artery here that branches out into the left circumflex and left anterior descending. And the right coronary artery uh, basically circles down the right side of the heart, goes around the back, um, and, and takes care of also part of the posterior wall, as well as the circumflex taking care of the posterior wall. So if you have an inferior infarct, then the question is, is the infarct really the right coronary artery? Now here's your other blind spot on the 12 lead EKG. We're not looking at the right side of the heart at all. All of these leads thus far have been looking at the left ventricle, and we're completely ignoring the right. 
And so something to be aware of is if you have an inferior STEMI, the question is, are you seeing bleed over from a right coronary artery infarct, a right-sided MI, or are you seeing bleed over from a posterior wall infarct that's now uh, extending down to the inferior wall? We already talked about how to spot the posterior MI. Now, how do you spot a right-sided MI? One of the things you can do is move one of the precordial leads over to the right side um, along the at the same uh, basic landmark. And in this case, we've moved the V4 lead over to the right side. We relabel that V4R for right. And if you have ST elevation in this lead, then you may actually have a right-sided infarct clinical pearl here. This is why in the EM circles we don't give nitrates to an inferior STEMI because that could very possibly indicate a right coronary artery infarction which is a preload dependent infarction and vasodilators can actually have a very precipitous effect uh, on the blood pressure and can actually cause uh, pretty significant hypotension. But that's for another lecture. Thanks for watching today. Hope you found the content clinically useful. If you have any topics that uh, you'd like to see covered, go ahead and leave those in the comments below. And we hope to have more content rolling out for you real soon.